Um, just want to welcome everybody to the 13th episode of the Platform Foundation Academy. Um, today we are joined by uh, my colleagues Robert Ninnis, uh, Lisa Holenstein, and we've got Mark Tognetti making a uh, quiet, quiet guest spot here. Um, and we're going to be talking about delegated development within the Now platform. We had mentioned that the presentation would be on mobile app development, but the Mobile Academy colleagues beat us to it. So we're going to provide a link to their session in the Academy community page. Um, as a huge note, San Diego Early Access is available today, which is awesome. Um, the docs are in the process of being updated as we speak, um, so you should be able to schedule the upgrade on your dev and sandbox instances. Um, item of note, this is Early Access, and once San Diego releases uh, general availability, we will be having a what's next with San Diego session, so I would say keep your eyes on our page for that link. Um, if you're interested before that, you can check out the content of the Developer Advocates or the Tech Now episode 93 that ran today. Um, it will be available on demand. It looks like Lisa is linking that out now, and we will include that link on our Academy page. So uh, as a brief intro, uh, my name is Kieran McMorrow. I am a outbound product manager here with the Creator Workflows group, um, and I will allow Robert if you'd like to give yourself an introduction. Well. Don't click on the screen yet. Good morning, guys. I'm coming to you from Brisbane, Australia. That's why this uh, session has been moved forward. Thank you. I uh, would have not really appreciated getting up four hours earlier because it's currently uh, 7 a.m. my time. Um, uh, I'm the elusive uh, third or fourth portrait on these title slides that you've never seen before, and mainly because these sessions are run at 2 a.m. my time. So um, it's a little bit difficult for me to make them. Uh, but I'm an outbound product manager for um, Creator Workflows. Uh, my boss, Mark, is on the call as well, and uh, Kiernan and Lisa are my colleagues. So together we run the global uh, outbound product management practice for Creator Workflows. Awesome. And we're super glad to have you on board today. Uh, Lisa, do you want to give yourself a real quick introduction? My name is Lisa Hohenstein. I'm an outbound product manager in um, currently the team of Mark Dignetti, um, working with Kiernan and Robert, um, covering creator workflows, specifically um, App Engine and App Engine Studio. Real quick, attendees, if you have any questions, please remember to ask them in the chat, and we will address them at breaks within the session or after the, pres uh, the presentation during our QA. Um, and just as a heads up, uh, we are going to give an overview of our delegated development within the current release. As always, uh, if we start talking about items that may be coming in uh, an upcoming release, we'll be make sure to call those areas out. Um, please make sure to make any purchasing decisions only on products that are currently available today. So with that, Robert, I will kick the ball over to you and totally look forward to hearing about delegated development. Thanks again. And so I'm, I'll do a bit of a, um, an intro on citizen development as well, and then we'll dive into delegated development and how that uh, how that works in tandem with a citizen development program. So today I'll be talking about three uh, main topics, uh, establishing a citizen development program, empowering the community through learning uh, and um, celebrating success and implementing guardrails and governance, which is where we'll get into the de delegated development portion. So to kick it off, we're going to start with a quick poll around citizen development and uh, are any of you um, currently running a program or are you thinking about doing it? So we're, we're pretty much 50-50 at the moment uh, for people running or in the process of setting one up. So this will be fairly useful for those who um, haven't yet made that uh, move into building a program out. As I said, about 50%. Um, last year was a massive year for citizen development. Um, the industry pretty much validated that, yes, it's a thing, and yes, it's uh, something that organizations uh, want to get involved with. There is a, a recognized pathway for unburdening IT uh, from application development and essentially releasing the, the smart people in line of business units to you know, realize their potential and um, take those Excel macros that they've been squirreling away for years and actually bring them to the forefront. A few definitions um, we'll talk about as we go through. A citizen development program is really about identifying, enabling, and empowering a community of citizen developers. It should be developed in service for the citizen developers. It should not hinder or 
provide roadblocks to getting into a citizen development. It should nurture um, and empower citizen developers to really take control of their application trajectory. There's a, a saying in DevOps, and I'm not saying there's lots of similarities between citizen development and, and DevOps, but in DevOps, it's really about you build it, you own it. And there's an element of truth with that in citizen development. We really want to empower line of business units to build applications, to automate parts of their job that they might find tedious or mundane and then really own the roadmap and the success of that application. So why citizen development? So a few of you that answered that you haven't yet started down the pathway of setting up a citizen development program might be wondering why would you want to actually set one up? The key points I'll call out here are really to shift IT resources away from lower priority projects onto the more complex projects that really require the coders to spend lots of time being creative to find intricate solutions for for applications that maybe require a lot of time to develop and having to manage the intake of small lower priority projects as well as these big organizational wide projects really splits the focus of the IT group and we want them doing what they do best so being able to shift these smaller line of business application development projects away from IT and into the hands of a citizen developer is really a, a massive win for IT resourcing and staffing and being able to um, redirect their focus. And the other- it's one of the things um, that I've, I've noticed as well, uh, Robert, is that you know the business owners of, of a particular business unit have the full kind of life cycle of, of their process typically in their head. And normally in the discovery phase of IT, you know, there's a limited time frame. And uh, business owners often, if they have you know the roles to be able to develop what they are uh, currently needing, um, they they have more runway to kind of think through the process end to end and be able to start building out those functionalities. So definitely, uh, as you said, shifts it away from IT and and I think gives a lot more power to the business unit to be able to fully encapsulate and and think through all the different workflows that they need to be able to accomplish. Absolutely. And they'll start automating one part of their business and their day-to-day -day will unlock other areas where they're like, oh, I never thought that that was possible. But now that I've got the tools to do it, I can take this on as well. <laughs> totally. So the, the other key point I want to pull out here is, is reducing the risk of shadow IT. So this is a massive problem within enterprises these days is that you know, every line of business, somebody has a credit card and they'll just you know, go and uh, purchase software, which they hope will help them automate parts of their business. And it may not even be like full applications these days. We're finding uh, plugins as well. So like Slack plugins and plugins for like Teams and other platforms also targets for shadow IT where you've got these, these little applications or applets running everywhere, controlling different parts of the business, which IT has no idea about. There might be data integrity issues there with regards to where the information is going from these uh, approved sources and then being shifted off into unapproved systems. Uh, so being able to claw that back and develop applications on an approved uh, low-code application development platform with full visibility for IT of what has been developed, what's on the roadmap, what's currently in progress being developed, and what is uh, currently deployed is you know, a massive win for the IT organization. So how do you actually set up a um, system development program? I'll quickly run through. There's there's really three phases. First phase is introducing low code into the organization. And this is where you start evaluating the platform. IT is heavily involved at this stage, looking at the low code application platform, evaluating it for fit for purpose. There's lots of them out there. Obviously we work with one of the best ones here at ServiceNow with App Engine Studio. There are use cases that App Engine Studio is not the best fit for, which you might find in your organization, you have more of those use cases. Um, training the Training IT, on that platform and learning how it works and how it fits within the broader organization, whether it's suitable for the, for your type of line of business users. Obviously, if you work in an IT organization, your general population might be a little bit more IT savvy. So yeah, making sure that it is at a level that your citizen developers will understand um, is really important. And then test it out, build an app, get the IT team to really you know kick the wheels on the platform build something and get a quick win. And at this stage, you might say, okay, this platform's not for us. 
let's go back to step one and uh, reevaluate something else. Or at the, you know, you might be doing two simultaneously at the same time and have a little bit of a hackathon against each other to see which one for that particular use case comes out ahead. Phase two is about building maturity on the platform. So this is where you start involving line of business users, identifying people that have been harassing your IT department for ages to get something done. And where you say, okay, well, you've been wanting this for ages. Why don't we go and build something together? So setting up a, a, an IT fusion team where you have uh, pro coders with line of business units who are hands-on. So a fusion team is not just about having the line of business telling the IT people what to build. It's really about doing not paired programming, but paired application development between those pro coders and citizen developers. And it's a great way to enable people starting their citizen development journey. And the last phase is um, starting to outline some of those best practices, writing uh, personas for who you will be targeting for citizen development. Uh, so there's two things there. There's people and then there's the applications. So identifying what applications would be a good fit for this program and what type of people would be a good fit for the program. And the third phase is formalizing and celebrating, essentially. Starting to really outline those technical guardrails in the second phase after you've evaluated, you've then mandated, this is the loco development application platform we're using. And in this phase, you're basically saying, these are the guardrails. These are the um, guidelines that you need to follow. So they might, they might be enablement guardrails, certain certifications that citizen developers need to complete before they're given the keys. So getting their driver's license, handing over the keys. Uh, you, we can make car analogies all day. So whether they got their manual or automatic license, go for the automatic license first, learn how to steer, learn how to brake and, and, and go forward. And then once you're competent with that, you've got the road sense. Go onto a manual license, start some scripting, maybe start some more complex um, tasks. Yeah, and, and I think that definitely makes makes sense. I mean, I think one of the, the major things is, is getting people used to the concepts behind um, development. You know, a lot of the time thinking like a developer um, doesn't necessarily have to do with the code. The code does kind of facilitate some of that thinking, but um, kind of the logic behind it is something that once... Uh, business stakeholders start to, to realize that they can fully kind of start breaking down those processes and, and uh, then really starting to uh, be able to define their business uh, use case and start creating applications from that. Absolutely. The platform should be in service of the developer and a good low-code application development platform won't start with code. <laughs> uh, you, you'll, you'll be trying to uh, work through these use cases and these automation targets by uh, first using their low code tools. So for example, if we were to, to build out parts of a workflow in App Engine Studio, we'd be using Flow Designer, which has very, very limited uh, coding. And then embracing the journey. So celebrating those wins, marketing to other parts of the, the, um, the business. So obviously at the, the early stages, you'll have fusion teams who've developed a couple of apps it's really critical at that stage to then take those quick, those wins and celebrate the success and market that back to other parts of the business to get them on board. That's the best way to supercharge your, the adoption of your citizen development platform. I think at this point, it's also very good to establish ways to measure the success. So it's always good to start with some KPI, some critical factor that you want to improve on with your custom app. And if you can measure that and calculate the, the amount of time you invested into this, the development of the app and, and calculate how much time you saved all of the people who are using the app, the more the better. So that is really a good approach to, to include here, have some way of measurement. And do we have any uh, kind of best practice recommendation around those kind of KPI generations? I was actually thinking about that today. We don't. We should probably um, we should probably build something. So there's two streams there. There's measuring the success of the program itself, and measuring success of the application. Obviously, one rolls into the other. If you have a successful application, you're more than likely going to have a successful program. And then conversely, if you, by all measurements, you might have a successful program, but not necessarily have successful applications. 
So how you measure those, it could be that you start measuring like people that have signed up might be a simple way to do it. Number of people signed up to the program. And then uh, a more mature metric would be those that have completed the required training to get started. And then from there, how many have created an app? How many have an application which has gone into production? And then the application level KPIs start taking over. So that's probably something that we should we should start thinking and defining um, is some baseline uh, KPIs for that. One quick poll, and then I will open the floor to questions. So for those that have um, started their citizen development journey, what phase do you think you're at at the moment? So do a little bit of self-identification and say, and just let us know maybe in phase one, introducing low code to the organization, starting to build maturity, or are you up and running? Or do you have no program at the moment? Cool, it looks like we've got a range of answers. And obviously we had some uh, who hadn't yet started, um, and obviously they've selected no program. It looks like the majority of people, you know, are in that first phase of evaluating uh, a low-code application platform. Yeah, so in that phase, obviously, I'll just quickly go back uh, and go over that again because this might be more relevant, is making sure you select the right platform, training a core team, and building confidence. All right, so I'll open the floor to any questions. I know that there's been stuff going on in the chat. Yeah, I saw that you build it, you own it the other day um, when I was doing a bit of research around DevOps. And I thought that was really applicable. You know, I, I like the phrase, but I think... Um doesn't necessarily get to the fact that you know you do have the support from the organization and the yes. admins who work inside service now so i think that that's that's an important uh, establishment because i think a lot of the time um business own, uh, owners don't tend to have um a lot of support when they homebrew applications and and that's something that traditionally leaves um gaps in in the business process you have somebody that leaves um, their access built program tends to break and then there's nobody know who knows how to support it. And then IT mm. uh, inherits it. So that's the great thing about uh, low code uh, built on the now platform is that you do have people that <laughs> can go through and, and kind of start detangling the application and, and, and really have uh, that governance model around it. Yeah. So um, one thing we didn't really talk about is, yeah, is ownership of support. So that's where the partnership with IT really needs to be really strong um, because they will be taking on ownership of support of these applications. But most of the time, if they're already using a platform like ServiceNow and they have that admin experience, they have that uh, defined process for creating and working through incidents with regards to the Now platform, it should be a lot easier to get their buy-in for support rather than some secret application that you've built in you know your garage at home so that's something that obviously needs to come out through the program like a and, uh, question in the chat there yep. uh, so anonymous says is there any published technical and process uh, guardrails that have been successful for other further in their citizen dev journey so do anybody that has experience you know have they kind of logged that in and have any prescriptions for the rest of this do we have published docs mark uh go into that in more detail uh, they do actually. The, so, the playbook. I think the playbook does, right? Yeah. So I think there's a, there's a couple of different docs. There is a launch and scale citizen development document. It's available on Now Create. That one's published and available. There's a document that will also go on Now Create. That's around uh, creating a citizen development center of excellence, and obviously an aspect of that is technical and process guardrails. That should be released. Fingers crossed in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and then there's success stories that are worth looking at. So one is, again, at the risk of promoting page again, what Novant is doing. Uh, there's a webinar there, which is excellent, actually. Uh, and you can find that, I think, if you just search on Novant Health Service Now Citizen Development. And then the last one is our friends at Jable have a case study that's also available. So I think, is there a single document that sort of says exactly what you need to do? Probably not, because I'm, I think it varies from company to company a bit. I would say so too. Yeah. And we will get those links and post them out on the platform academy. Oh, perfect. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah, and, and just one last pitch. So um, particularly for those documents that we authored, 
the success workbook, the citizen development COE doc, I mean, we, we would really love feedback, right? Is it, is it useful? Is it practical? Is it actionable? What's missing? So please, uh, please, please email Rob with feedback. So two things I'd like to pull out um, through that journey of setting up a, a citizen development program is enablement, making sure you have a learning path created, you know, that certifies citizen developers to begin their journey in citizen development and rewards further learning. So there are a number of ways you could do this. Obviously, uh, now learning is a great place to get started. We have a learning path for citizen developers there and putting in different licensing requirements or certification requirements for those different levels of access into either App Engine Studio or further development is a great way to encourage further learning. I'm sure the majority of citizen developers will be fairly proactive about it because that's really the kind of person that you go after initially, at least. Having that reward piece in there is important to keep people motivated, which leads into the celebration of success. So sharing success with others is obviously the key to momentum for citizen development programs. So the citizen developer, who are they and what does their persona look like? The key part of this definition is using IT approved technology and processes. So can't stress it enough that citizen developers very, very quickly become rogue if they start using non IT approved technology and processes. The citizen developer, you know, is a tech savvy person who has an analytical mind who can deconstruct business processes. As Keenan was saying, they hold their business process in their in their mind and they can see exactly where there are opportunities for automation or opportunities for technology to really enhance parts of that workflow. They don't necessarily need to have coding skills, but having that analytical mind will really set them up for success. They obviously have shown an interest in application development in the past. So whether that's trying and failing to implement something within their, their line of business already, so that might be like a conglomeration of spreadsheets and email, things like that, and has a willingness to obviously adhere to those guardrails and those uh, policies and practices and standards that we set up through the program. Citizen development is all around community. So in those first two phases of the program, IT will be heavily involved with setting up the platform, establishing the guardrails, defining the community standards and what's expected of citizen developers. But then as the program matures, it really should be self-regulating. So your community of citizen developers will get together and basically be able to choose their own destiny when it comes to, obviously in partnership with IT, but they'll take on that mentorship, that leadership, that support role more and more and it will obviously be able to step back further and further as I the, think anybody uh, that has a uh, development background at all you, you understand that sometimes uh, developers develop the uh, this kind of mentality where you do things a particular way and i think having new blood people that aren't traditional developers come in um, your problem solving skills come from a different vantage point. So I think that that's really important about having that community because somebody might solve a problem that traditional development modalities wouldn't necessarily lead to. And so you can kind of guide people through breaking down their own process and being able to explain it um, in a way that is less technical um, and, and give people more ownership of that process. Absolutely. The most difficult thing in a, pe in a previous life, I was a software engineer for the PA and reporting team. The most difficult thing I found was as a somewhat of a perfectionist is letting the junior engineers write software <laughs> because, <laughs> and you'll find that IT is also very hesitant to, you know, there's a particular way that you've got to do something and they might have strong opinions around like data structures, et cetera, but if, yep. if as I learned, you know, you're just doubling your workload if, or even probably tripling it, if you have to constantly, you know, double check somebody else's work. And there is a level of trust there that you need to be able to say, okay, look, I know you're competent, you know, I'm going to have to let go and <laughs> not micromanage you. <laughs> so IT will, will obviously go through uh, a bit of a, uh, a phase there as well, where they need to learn to let go and step back. But Hopefully, you know, once these practices are set up, coding standards, data structure standards, uh, once they're set up, communicated and followed, it should make it a lot easier. We tend to see 
uh, three types of developers um, throughout this process. And obviously, uh, the citizen developer is a key part of the maturity of your, your program. And as you shift further towards uh, the right here by enabling and um, upskilling more and more citizen developers, you'll start to see these business outcomes. So improving speed and efficiency, freeing up IT resources, empowering businesses, the business with agility, empowering the business to kind of own their own destiny in the fact that they are now a part of the application development process for their own lines of business um, and really harnessing you know, the innovation that comes from partnering with, uh, with people who are the experts in their field. There was a trend a couple of years ago that every company was redefining themselves as a technology company. So I'm not, I'm not a healthcare provider. I'm a technology company in the healthcare space. I'm not a logistics provider. I'm a technology company who also does logistics. While there's a little bit of, you know, smoke and mirrors in play there, the reality is fairly accurate that you know, a lot of these business uh, processes are, are run using technology these days. And there's a lot of innovation that happens at that line of business level. And that's where people in IT would never dream to apply technology in a particular way. And, and that's where innovation happens. And that's where you can really build up things like uh, your intellectual uh, property portfolios. And the talk really becomes a bit of a reality there when you have innovation happening at that level where you do see organizations owning who were traditionally healthcare providers owning technology innovation in that space because they've really enabled um, their line of business users to get involved. So the fusion teams we'll talk about in a second are really the combination of the, the, the distributed uh, developers and the citizen developers being able to inject a, a business unit with a pro coder who will work alongside and do paired application development is where you, um, you have these fusion teams forming. Uh, now platform core developers can get involved where necessary to be able to enable more technical aspects of an application. For example, if they need integrations built that we don't offer out of the box, there might be some need there to involve core developers. But the combination of these distributed uh, line of business developers and the system developers initially is where you'll see the program really accelerating. So one last poll is around you personally. What type of developer do you identify with? Are you a you know a core developer in the IT team? Are you a distributed developer who works with line of business every day? Or do you fit the per persona of a line of business user or a citizen developer? And there is obviously one option there to say, I'm not a developer, I'm a business stakeholder, stakeholder or a primary program owner. And I, I think it's really in, interesting and, and empowering that we're kind of opening up the definition of what it is to be a developer, because mm. a, a lot of the time, you know, folks are like, yeah, I could never, I could never be a developer. I don't understand code, but most people do have that, those kind of internal tools of logic and being able to intuit out what are the functionalities that they inherently need. Um, a lot of the time, the, the biggest thing that I tell people about being a developer is you just need to have the ability to ask questions and really get to the ask of what's going on. And I think that that's really important because I think a lot of people have that skill and um, don't have to be intimidated by the code thing because there are tools that are available, low code, no code tools that allow people to really branch out and, and help um, develop these solutions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Half of the problem is defining the, well, defining the problem. <laughs> exactly. Being able, to, being able to communicate the problem is, is, uh, is, a, is a skill that, Honestly, a lot of developers lack, um, and so. The other uh, side of that coin is to identify what is the outcome you want to get to. Most most likely, people are talking about and and coming to IT and say, "I want to do this and that," but they're not really looking at what is their target. What are they actually trying to achieve with doing this and that? And sometimes it helps to formulate. What is the desired outcome? Because maybe other developers or, or seasoned developers can find a better way to do that with exactly. the tools that are available. One of the things that I've noticed in my development career is as you ask these questions, a lot of the time, um, 
essentially it's it's a band-aid on top of a band-aid on top of a band-aid and as you start pulling those off you realize that the actual ask is something vastly different than was originally proposed <laughs> and and so the really the, as you're saying lisa finding out what the intended outcome is really helps to inform the solution and how you start to uh, break down that that ask into um solving the real the real issue that's going on yeah you laugh, Robert, like you, you, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that, that pivoting from one solution to the next to the next without stepping back and actually realizing what, the, what you're trying to solve and what the ask is, as Lisa very um, succinctly pointed out, is, is all too common. And then you just have this Jenga stack of technology that's trying to solve nothing and falls apart in the end. So it looks like a majority of our audience here are core developers, which is not unsurprising um, given the content of these academies. But now I challenge yourselves to really think about how you can try to empower uh, a new generation of developer, a citizen developer, to help work with you to develop solutions for your organization that maybe you would never think of or not have the time to really sit and build. All right, so we're getting to the meaty end of the presentation, then I'll jump into App Engine Studio and start playing around a little bit. We talked about Fusion Teams, Gartner defines them fairly well as a, a blend of technology and business domain expertise. And guardrails and governance is where we're going now. So governance really allows citizen development to occur, full stop. Without governance, you know, it's, it's gonna be the wild west out there without a mandate on the platform that you're using. Anybody with a budget can go and <laughs> buy a software and you know, start trying to use it uh, without support from IT, without uh, the, the technical expertise to get started. And development can really only occur uh, in compliance with best practices and guardrails. And there's a number of different ways you can implement technical guardrails within App Engine Studio and ServiceNow. There's two which uh, more inherited from the platform and the platform architecture, and that's platform security and application security. And the third is uh, where we'll get into more of the de delegated development aspect, which is the tools that uh, you have as a developer when using App Engine Studio. So platform security, um, obviously ServiceNow uh, has a whole bunch of literature about our architecture and how we secure the platform and a small selection of, of those aspects are the instance architecture being single tenant, our certifications when it comes to dealing with sorts of data and dealing with, for example, like uh, the federal space, having our data centers certified, HTML sanitization, antivirus scanning of attachments, and anything that goes through uh, our platform is obviously checked. And our platform is obviously rig rigorously pen tested and uh, et cetera. And when it comes to HTML, obviously there's you know a big scary cross-site scripting and HTML injection issues that we are always trying to um, be on top of. And then we have uh, more privacy focused security measures like VPNs, et cetera, that you can set up. On the application side of things, we have RBAC. Is it role or row? I, I think both apply, but role based ACLs and being able to specify down to the field level access for on, on data. Scoped applications, which we'll get into it a little bit. These are, these are all kind of inherited guardrails that you get from the application um, architecture. Inheritance from extending applications and using templates in App Engine Studio. So templates are a great way to set up initial guardrails around the types of applications that can be developed. Login and authentication, obviously, and uh, web service security with regards to integrations and that goes for things that are you know uh, included in flow designer etc so applications scoping model there's a lot of platform core developers here so I'll, I'll gloss over this a little bit um, because most of you will already know this but when it comes to application scoping being able to logically separate applications from each other whether they're deployed from uh, ServiceNow out of the box sources, the ServiceNow store, which might be from partners or ISV developers, custom apps that you yourself develop, and obviously global application bundles. And whether they come through app repo, update sets, 
source control. There's these runtime protections that enable security in these kind of walled gardens, which are called application scopes. And then there's the developer tools. So delegated development and source control are the two main aspects of control you have with regards to application guardrails that you can set up within App Engine Studio. Delegated development is quite powerful. The ability to set permissions for each user based on uh, file type access, security and entitlement, programming tools, so allowing scripting, application management with regards to inviting and managing collaborators, using source control and deploying the application are some of the controls that you have in the delegated development environment. I might actually just switch into ServiceNow and we can have a look at it as we go through. So if you haven't already enabled it, uh, delegated development is a plugin that you may need to install separately. And while that loads, I'll show you the two different views that you have. So it's probably included if you install App Engine Studio, at least there. Most likely. So delegated development. So just double check if you're not seeing the options that I'm showing um, today, double check that the plugin is installed. Okay, so you can access um, delegated development through uh, both Dev Studio and App Engine Studio. We'll spend most of our time in App Engine Studio today, but Dev Studio, um, you still have the option here to manage collaborators. And you'll notice that the view is very, very similar. So. I think they actually that. updated it with the version that you see in App Engine Studio. It looks very similar now. A lot yes, more similar does. than before. <laughs> yes, there's no two different views anymore. So from the App Engine Studio homepage, you can choose uh, an application um, to start editing, which obviously will have you choose an application but in the top right hand corner here, you'll see uh, a manage collaborators button, which will allow the application owner, system administrator, and any um, application editors with the permissions to be able to invite uh, collaborators to collaborate or manage the application. Um, once they've been approved to collaborate on the application, you can then go and set custom uh, application permissions. So next to each user, you'll see a drop down here where you can uh, choose predefined editor or owner permission levels and uh, a custom level. So uh, the custom um, level allows you to uh, pick and choose what uh, application permissions you want to define. There are a number around file type access. So so these are pretty self-explanatory, limiting access to things like Flow Designer, UI Builder, Reporting, Mobile Studio, uh, et cetera, uh, tables and forms. Security entitlement, so managing ACLs and roles. So this is not just in the, the role builder that comes with App Engine Studio, but also if you are looking at the advanced view of a table, being able to individually access those AP ACLs as well. I will say that, just uh, mention that managing ACLs and roles is dependent on obviously <laughs> being able to see the tables. So if you have this unchecked and this checked, uh, it won't, um, they won't play nicely with each other. You won't be able to, you'll be able to get halfway through creating the role and you won't be able to apply it to a table. So scripting is a, is another great a guardrail to set up or, or like a, a uh, certification level that you might consider applying as a, a best practice in your program. So once the citizen developer reaches a certain level of certi certification or competency within, and so that might be a now learning course, or it might be, you know, a, a separate JavaScript coding course that you define, you might turn on the scripting uh, ability and this restricts scripting for pretty much everywhere. So you know, in ACLs, advanced um, scripting functions there in Flow Designer. One thing I noticed is it doesn't actually seem to restrict scripting parameters in UI Builder yet. So that's probably something that's still being worked on. So if you're binding a property to UI Builder, you can either use a existing data source or you can use a script. This doesn't seem to affect that, but that's, that's okay because you can turn off UI Builder directly. Yeah, application management. 
the the big one here i would say is source control so being able to determine whether a user has access to be able to uh, commit changes into source control you may only allow one or two developers uh, working on the application to do this and it's um, quite easy if you uh, yeah, have well, yeah, we got if, five I minutes jump left. In, if I can jump in real quick, yeah, we've, we've got about five minutes left and I uh, want to open the floor to some questions. Yep. I really appreciate the demo. It's been really awesome uh, looking how we can kind of do some of the details of a delegated uh, development. But uh, yeah, I want to open the floor. Anybody in the attendees, if you have questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat uh, and love to answer those for you. But uh, yeah, this has been a great session so far. We've got a ton of links that we're going to be able to provide to you guys. And uh, those will be in the Platform Academy um, uh, community page. Uh, we may, we'll make sure to get those out to you. Uh, Lisa, Mark, you got any other parts you want to throw in before we kind of start wrapping up? It's Mark, I think the only thing I'll add is um, over the next X number of releases, I can't, I can't tell you the number, right? Well, you'll slowly see delegated development becoming the control mechanism for more and more of our builders, right? I think you've yeah. seen over the last couple of releases, we've started adding things to it. I mean, you know, Rob mentioned the, the ability to control scripting in one place, but not in the other. Really delegated dev will ultimately become, you know, I'd say over the next two or three releases, the control mechanism for what you can control, regardless of developer persona, pro dev to citizen dev, how you control what they can do. Well, that's awesome. Well, it doesn't look like we have too many more questions here in the in the chat so far, but uh, it's been really informative. Great, uh, great session, Robert. Thank you so much for joining us. I know it's an early morning for you, but uh, yeah, I think uh, Lisa's in the the depths of the night, and I'm uh, looking forward to <laughs> my day as well. So. <laughs> Truly a global, uh, global team that we've got going on here. As a reminder, uh, with prior Academy sessions, we will be posting this video on YouTube and all questions will be available on the Platform Academy session page on the community. So uh, we will include any relevant links that Robert or the rest of the team has provided. Um, so thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, this is the 13th session. Uh, we will be working on presenting some new sessions uh, in the next uh, month or so, and you will be able to find any information um, on that community page that we mentioned before. So once again, thanks for joining us on the uh, Creator Workflows and Platform Academy, and uh, really appreciate you joining us today. And uh, Robert, thank you very much for the presentation. Lisa, as yes. always, appreciate uh your sparkling commentary and mark thank you for the sage advice thank you so much thanks everyone all. thanks for joining You're welcome have, have a, a wonderful weekend, night everyone cheers guys